Revolution of the 18th century was a defining period in American history. Not only did the economy and population both witness outsized growth, but also changes in labor, production, and consumption. Urbanization and job opportunities brought people from across the country to big cities. Another product of this time period was Victorianism. It emerged out of a growing, not entirely unjustified, concern that the market revolution was eroding moral discipline and individual character. Victorians sought to reinforce moral integrity, self-control, and industriousness. They believed that, without any external influence of moral institutions, a strong sense of individual morality could do the same. Victorians frowned upon any activity seen as not constructively building Victorian values, viewing them as impulsive, reckless, brutish, and demonstrating an overall lack of personal restraint. As a stark contrast to Victorianism, a subculture of single young males flocked to major population centers. The subculture emerged as an expression of dislocation, change to identity, and loss of workplace gratification. These young men tended to gather in urban taverns and saloons, where they could find a generous supply of alcohol and camaraderie among peers. Market revolution towns were filled with young, single males living without the institutions that reinforced Victorian morals and values. In fact, they often enjoyed poking fun at Victorian pretensions and saw them as too strict. These opposing morals created a cultural clash among the American urban population. At the heart of the market revolution, there was a publisher who stood against the crushing oppression of Victorianism. Before there was a celebrity gossip column, he invented it. Before there was a sports page, he created it. Before the advent of the girly magazine, he provided it. When the sport of boxing was illegal and widely considered immoral, this man championed, promoted, and popularized it all the way into public and legal acceptance. The heads of respectable publications looked down on him, but then raced to imitate him when his success was undeniable. This publisher's name was Richard Kyle Fox. As a young man, Fox made friends with two professional engravers who were given ownership of a dying journal called the National Police Gazette as payment for debts owed to them by the journal's early publisher. Founded in 1845, it was the oldest weekly in the country. It had been created as a combatant against crime, but under the inept direction of George W. Matzell, ex-chief of police in New York, its standards had sunk so low that it was eventually selling only to the crooks it was supposed to expose. The engravers hired Fox to sell ads, and he did so so well, he soon had them in his debt. They paid him off by giving him the paper. The news was real, and it was shocking. If it was violent and gory, great. If it involved sexual infidelity, wonderful. If it included both, perfect. The details were gratuitously graphic. At a time when newspapers approached everything with grave severity, Fox printed religious, political, and criminal satire. He went so far as to print his publication on pink paper, another departure from his competitors. The Police Gazette wasn't created in a vacuum. It was formed around the wants and needs of a working-class culture that was constantly struggling to help fill the void left in individuals by the market revolution. Though these groups found a tremendous amount of freedom, they also found urban life much less satisfying. While Richard Kyle Fox may have been called bigoted, narrow-minded, shameless, and more than slightly ridiculous, he was also a genius. He knew what his readers wanted, and provided the male bachelor subculture with detailed woodcuts of crime, sports, and of course, women. The population imbalance in urban areas heavily favored males, and made it extremely difficult to find a partner, pushing the average marriage age back for urban men. In 1890, the U.S. Census Bureau counted 41.7% of all American males over the age of 15 as single, the highest national proportion recorded by the Bureau until the mid-1990s. Fox's portrayal of women in the Gazette was heavily shaped by this percentage of bachelors. The renowned columnist Franklin P. Adams said that the articles on pulgarism never really appealed to him. What got him were the women. Fox had an army of artists to draw what his customers wanted. But of course, viewed by Victorians, the Police Gazette was beyond sinful. To get around the Victorian clothing style of the period, namely the voluminous and lengthy dresses, Fox's artists often depicted girls falling down on roller skates or being assaulted by gusts of wind. Fox never directly stated that ankles, knees, thighs, and cleavage were the focus of more than half his illustrations. It was just that women tended to fight with one another, or get tossed off of steers, or get their skirts stuck in barbed wire, when this happened, naturally their skirts jumped up and their ankles showed. 
A notable historian and longtime contributor to American heritage, Gene Smith, had this to say about Kyle Fox's readers. His readers lived in towns in which the street paving ended where the trolley made its turnaround. Their wrists were thick and their nails dirty. Their surroundings were grimy and dreary. Coal dust in the winter, mud in the spring, and the smell of horse manure all year round. There was precious little spice in their lives. So let them look at the ankles in Fox's illustrations. Of significant importance to traditional ideals of manliness was the ever-changing workplace. With the market revolution creating more menial and repetitive jobs, there was an inherent loss of individual identity that most workers had grown accustomed to with occupations revolving around artisanship and craftsmanship. With economic growth came a loss of camaraderie in the workplace. The intimate connection between an apprentice and a master was quickly replaced with a detached employee-employer relationship. As a result, most young men had no hope of ever owning their own shop or to advance in their occupation, so they no longer derived a sense of worth from their jobs. This loss prompted a rise in the popularity of spectacles such as boxing. A style of living that is not so much the opposite of high Victorian genteelty as its underside. The world of sport, the uncultivated macho dandy, whose love of sport has nothing to do with the high Victorian ideal of athletics, and everything to do with the eternal gamble against fate, who would bet on anything and was therefore willing to turn loose all minor vices, gambling, lechery, gluttony, profanity, and blood sports that were kept leashed in the social sphere above him. When Fox took over the Gazette in 1878, boxing was prohibited in every jurisdiction in the country. Bouts were fought at night or in secret, taking place outside the law. Dates and location were kept hidden until the last possible moment and only given to the sporting fraternity or the fancy. Boxers and spectators alike risked prosecution by law for just being there. So if a newspaper wanted to remain respectable but still sell to readers who were interested in boxing, they would send a reporter to capture every detail of the match and then print it while simultaneously preaching boxing's brutality and obscenity. Richard Kyle Fox had no patience for such hypocrisy and set out to cover boxing as if it were already legitimate, going so far as to promote individual fighters, act as stakeholder, and even sanction matches as representing the Police Gazette Championship. Unfortunately, the Gazette was a victim of its own success. As historian Howard P. Chittacuff remarked while referring to the old paper, Time changes, and popularity is fleeting. By the 1900s, the Gazette was being outdone by daily tabloids like Hearst, Pulitzer, and McCormick, while simultaneously losing its own vigor. Readers could find all the tantalizing articles they wanted every day in other papers. Fox began substituting his famous woodcuts with regular photographs of racing cars, horses, yachts, baseball players, boxers, and every once in a while, a modestly clad actress. The Gazette was sliding into obscurity when Fox, worth $2 million, passed away in his home at Red Bank, New Jersey, on 11-14-1922. The National Police Gazette has planted itself firmly in history. It's been cast in a mostly negative light, and during its era, was blamed by Victorians for aiding the corruption of society. However, Richard Carl Fox only gave his readers what they wanted. The Police Gazette didn't pollute American culture. It was both born and shaped by it. The Gazette was a reflection of the frustrations felt by the working class. The product Fox produced, by inference, can be seen as a direct window into the American bachelor subculture of the market revolution. His publication affected almost every aspect of modern-day men's magazines, and the Police Gazette will forever be remembered as a newspaper that started it all.